Uh, let me briefly introduce um, your esteemed panel for this conversation, and then we'll jump straight into it. Um, in this direction, we are joined uh, by uh, Mike Siegel, CEO of Cashflower. We have Gareth Jones, uh, co-funder uh, and general partner of FinTech Collective. Nadim Sheikh is founder uh, and CEO of Anthemis. Uh, uh, Yepa Zink, general partner at North Zone. Um, and Reshma Sahoni, founding partner at Seedcamp. And now they're all wearing uh, investor hats, but they are also, of course, deeply uh, entrepreneurial in their own right. Um, and we're going to be exploring some really interesting uh, topics in our uh, conversation this morning. Um, we have a truly international perspective as well, from the west to the east coast of America, through Europe and the city of London. So I want to start, Gareth, um, you're New York based. I am. Just talk us through um, what you see as the main differences in the investment environment for this sector, um, in the differences between the UK and the US. Yeah, I think it's, um, so yes, yeah, so I, I run a uh, fintech focused early stage venture capital firm in, London, in, in New York called Fintech Collective. Um, and I think, I think if it's the, the sort of the buzzword that I would probably layer on top of this is just one of maturity. I think it's, you know, if you think about what's gone on in Silicon Valley, it's really been building over a 40 year period. So just the, uh, the depth of maturity in both the investor base, but also the talent um, is, uh, is one of just mature, maturity. In New York, I think we're probably uh, 12 years into that, um, if I were to guess. Uh, and I think here in, in London, we're probably around five years into that. So I think that probably just gives a, a sense of maturity on both the investing side and also uh, where, the, where, where the entrepreneurial talent is. And that maturity that, that you talk about, does that translate to cooler heads when we're talking about valuations and overvaluations? Do you think there's, there, are, there are cooler heads in the US? No, I think, um, you know, we were discussing this just a few minutes ago behind, behind the scenes, and I think a lot of what's gone on in, in, in valuations has perhaps already happened. I think we've already seen the sort of the, the cooling down uh, occur. I think, I think what um, I would say to, to entrepreneurs and just sort of practical advice around, uh, around that is just make sure you're spending time building a relationship early on with uh, potential investors, uh, and, uh, and be prepared for a deeper level, a deeper level of inspection around, uh, about, around profitability and about how much money you're going to need to get to profitability. Um, sticking with a, a US theme, um, Mike, you're West Coast based. Um, and in addition to uh, your, your, your investment hat and your funding and your support, um, you also run um, cash flower. Um, yep. And this, this principally helps SMEs ensure that they don't run out of money, um, which is a pretty crucial uh, element. Um, so with that in mind, as well as with your investment perspective, and perhaps sticking with a sort of a US take on, on any differences that the West Coast might offer, um, what, is the, what is the most appropriate growth strategy at the moment for a startup? What, what is your advice? What are you seeing? Um, so so uh, just a little bit of background, 500 Startups, if you're not familiar, is an early stage uh, investment fund and accelerator based in Silicon Valley. We've got about 1,600 investments worldwide, about 100 in fintech, so we've got a, a fair amount of perspective. Uh, good times are bad. I think the number one thing that we try and teach entrepreneurs is that the way investors think is when an investment is made, they want to know that when the money's out, there is a significant milestone hit that will allow for raising of more money. So understanding what those milestones are is for an early stage company the key to making sure they don't run out of money. A little bit different than SMEs, but that's, that's probably the most important thing for, for startups. And you've been doing this for 20 years. Yeah, um, Cashflower is my sixth startup. <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of a recidivist. And how, what are the principal changes that you've noticed during that time? Uh, it's much cheaper to start a company. It's much more expensive to scale a company is probably the, the number one thing. Mm, mm. Um, yeah, but you, you, you're another old hand, if I can, if I can put it like that. Um, what do you identify at the moment? You've got a huge body of experience. Perhaps you can just talk us through some of it. Um, and then perhaps you could touch on what you see as some of the principal risks in this environment. What keeps you up at night? Or what is it that you think perhaps other people have not seen? Yeah, so I, I started my investment career in 98, 99 with a Deutsche Bank funded uh, fund. We didn't call it a fintech uh, fund or anything, but I guess two thirds of what we did was uh, what today we would term fintech. 
I suppose just like then there was a different issue as the bubble that came along with 2000 was when things go too fast and people are not thinking through the long term. I mean, these businesses are supposed to be healthy fundamentally over the long term. And I think a lot of what we're seeing currently is people are saying, oh, what's the latest thing that's coming in? Is this insurance tech or whatever? What are the key parameters in that tech? But they're not really thinking about how do we build something that's long and lasting? So one of our greatest fintech companies is Klarna. They were set up 11 years ago. You know, they're not growing 300% a year. They don't need to. They're incredibly healthy. They're profitable, been profitable for nine years. I think that's a company that has set out a long-term course, and I see few companies currently thinking that way. And we were chatting earlier um, about some parallels that you perhaps saw between some of the hype around um, alternative finance at the moment and what three, four, five years ago we were seeing in payday lending, etc. Um, do you think there are some uh, points for concern on the horizon in alternative finance in particular? Yeah, I think, listen, fintech, the uh, common denominator has to be risk, whatever you're doing in the value chain. And, and, and that means things are going to go wrong. And, and currently, we haven't seen many things go wrong. I think in the US, we've seen uh, Lending Club having, having a few uh, unhappy shareholders and, and partners and some lawsuits being launched. And suddenly, you see the jitters in the share price, despite uh, the performance is good. I think uh, nobody saw Wonga and what happened to uh, that company before it suddenly happened. And it started with a small PR scandal that then snowballed. And regulation caught up very fast suddenly. I think you're going to see across peer-to-peer, -peer, it's essentially a banking industry. Why shouldn't it be regulated? It's a question of how to regulate it. And I think as soon as we get those PR stories that's going to come, uh, you're going to see things happening. Uh, so you're going to see those that are planned for it and those that are navigating it well and those that are taking more risk than perhaps they should. Okay, I'm going to come back to that um, at some point, but I, I want to bring in um, Reshma, who has invested uh, in some of the most high-profile uh, businesses of our time in this sector. Um, what would your advice be to entrepreneurs who are approaching investors this year? I mean, I think um, one of the key differentiators we've seen with our companies like TransferWise, Property Partner, and others who've been more successful than, than some of our other companies, I think capital's been a real differentiator. So I think the earlier you are that you can raise you know, significant capital um, and, and pair that with economics. So again, to, you know, to Yepe's point around uh, sort of fundamental economics, I, you know, we're, we're sort of espousing that as a, as a better way to, to sort of survive the next few years and, and be there in the, in the next decade or, or more. So I think capital is a, a definite differentiator. Um, and rather than spending it on perhaps on marketing and so forth, you know, really on the fundamentals and also, you know, uh, building your team. So I think core is kind of building a team around people who understand regulatory, um, the regulatory world, policy world, um, you know, product, and, and again, the fundamental kind of financial aspects of the business. So a core team, get enough capital that will help you weather the storm, um, focus on the you know, fun fundamental kind of core, core economics, and I think that should sort of put you in a good stead for, for the longer haul. And Nadim, you have worked with some of the uh, most interesting innovators and some of the largest financial institutions. Let's get to the nub of, 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 of this morning's conversation. Do we have a problem with valuations in this sector? I don't think so. I'm not, uh, we're not seeing it. I think this is a um, long-term play. Uh, there is a dramatic unbundling of the financial institution going on, whether it's a bank or insurance company or wealth management, doesn't matter. Um, I think what people that have been investing in this space for a while understand that this is not something that you do over the next two, three, three years. This is five, 10, 15, 20 a play. And so uh, I think it's about staying the course, about focusing on the fundamentals, which a lot of the panelists have talked about, is focusing on the economics, uh, making sure these are real businesses, uh, focus on the fin part as opposed to the tech part. Tech is taken for granted. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, table stakes. And really it's about building the right businesses. That, that's what makes sense. Um, you so say you focus on the, on the fin rather than the tech, and you mentioned the fact that, that, that you see this as a, a 10, 15, 20 year um, time frame. But of course, there is, is there not still tension between the ambition for an early exit versus the longer term strategy? I think there's a difference between uh, generalist uh, you know, f uh, funds that are out there as opposed to folks focus on fintech. Uh, there is a, a longer term horizon. Uh, this is you know, bred into the model. 
Uh, the models are more complicated, the industry is more complicated. It takes, uh, that's why you see a lot more mature uh, entrepreneurs coming in uh, than you would see in other industries. And I think this is a combination of that that comes together. So I don't think, uh, I think this is about a longer term play. But I, think, I think one of the things we're also thinking about is a lot of the fintech innovation you see are point solutions. So, you know, led by the consumer market and um, entrepreneurs are going after specific sort of, you know, cutting services that banks offer. But I think if you're going to be here for the next 20 years, all these companies are going to, ha all these startups are going to have to evolve into multi-product companies. I, you know, I think it's a, it's a question we're sort of debating is whether a single product global brand is, you know, is going to have that staying power or will it have to become a multi-product global brand? So, and, I, and I, I, I would vote for the latter. And we are so early still. I mean, this is, yeah. this is really, you know, yeah. this is it's such, we're still, you know, even, even the big sort of, you know. And you say point. that, you've been doing it for 15 years as well, Gareth. Well, I've, I've done it. you still view this as an early. So, I've, I, yeah, I mean, I, I've done it as both an entrepreneur and an operator on the outside and now as an investor um, on the other side of the table. And, you know, I was 26 building a business called Multex here in London and I was having to take the CIO of Scottish Widows to an internet cafe to actually talk, talk him through what was actually, you know, what was actually happening uh, with this wonderful thing called the internet. Um, you know, I think, I, I think people need to, to remember that it's actually been going on for a, a very long time. Um, most, you know, most of the sort of really cool stuff was built before the financial crisis actually inside of banks with very talented teams. I think that's now obviously coming coming out of those, those institutions. But you know, if you look at, even to your point about alternative lending, if you look at how much of the market they've actually been able to catch, we're still in sort of single digit percentage points of total addressable market. So we're still incredibly, uh, incredibly yeah. early. And things like the blockchain are gonna take you know, far longer than I think everyone perhaps imagined last year to actually play out. So I think this thing, to Dean's point, is a, yeah. is a generational opportunity. Certainly alternative finance accounts to something like a rounding error when it comes to the, the bite they've taken out of, of mainstream banking operations. Um, but Yepa, you are a little more skeptical when it comes to valuations, perhaps a little more pessimistic um, than the Deeb. You do think that, 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 um, that we've, already entered, we've already entered, we've already entered this, you know. the danger zone. No, I, I'll, I'll take the side with you. Yeah, yeah. I, listen, I, I am to the extent that I see there's a subsegment of uh, companies that, that treat their financial technology business in the same way you treat an e-commerce business. They talk about unit economics. They, uh, they talk about the, the growth side of it. Uh, they rarely talk about the uh, you know, operational risk side, the metrics that you're building underlying. And I think a lot of those businesses are doing well with VCs because you know, they're showing the sort of high level metrics you would expect of an e-commerce company. Uh, but I think a lot of them are going to run into real issues. And, and I think uh, there's some, a lot of these companies consume a lot of capital because guess what? It, it costs $10, $20 to get an e-commerce customer. It costs uh, $100, $200, $300 to get a proper uh, financial consumer technology customer in through the door and therefore uh, it's capital intensive so you see mega rounds and currently uh, that's not easy to raise. Mike can I just ask you about the your, your, your thoughts on the current investment landscape um, you know, regrettably we have to report on our, our front page today that, that there are a number of issues of concern uh, in the city and in and in the, uh, in the UK economy here and indeed there are elements in, in, the, in, in the global economy of, of, of genuine cause for concern. What impact does this have on people seeking investment and indeed making investment. Um, I mean, you mentioned that there was, there's always a flight to quality. Yeah, well, I guess there's two things, right? We're, we're in the US market at least, and we usually see Europe um, and the rest of the world follow, we have a, a slight downturn in investment right, pace as we go into a US election. Uh, this time around, it's an absolute bloody mess. Uh, and we're also at the, the end of a credit cycle, which is going to deflate us even a little bit more. Um, so we've seen stuff basically come down. Now, for very early stage investors, that's a great thing because it means all of a sudden talent becomes available at a reasonable price again. Um, on the entrepreneur side, I mentioned metrics before. I tend to disagree. I think the hardest thing to do in fintech is acquire financial services customers. So we like to see companies able to acquire very inexpensively. Um, and then once they're able to prove those, those economics, then you know, you're not going to raise Series A unless you know your operations, your regulation, and all the rest. But usually you can demonstrate that you can acquire customers earlier 
than, than having those things in line. I, I mean, the reason why I disagree, I think, is that we most found companies, something. yeah, <laughs> sit over here, is that um, a round companies come out and say, look, I have the established distribution strategy with the established unit cost, and it's only going to go down because of volume effect. It never goes down, it goes up. It only gets more complex. So you see a lot of companies that haven't seen the film making assumptions based on some uh, cohort that's maybe 18 months uh, old and thinking that's gospel. And actually what happens is that it's exactly the opposite and therefore the, the, the uh, funding round and the business plan is flawed from the outset. Now that's not disastrous, it just means that these companies got to go through some tough uh, funding rounds where they have to raise and they haven't achieved what they told their existing investors they would achieve. And, and you're going to see a lot of those in the next 12 months. A couple of minutes left. I just want to focus on London for a moment. Um, London has secured uh, or has retained its number one spot in the Global Financial Centers Index, um, which was announced last week. It's just pipped New York to the post, having seized the crown from New York last year. Um, just coming down the panel, um, starting uh, with Reshma, is this London's year? Does London still have what it takes to, to be the fintech capital of, of the world? Um, I mean, y yes, definitely. I think talent, again, is a big part of it. So I do think, you know, if you're, if you're building a big, big business and hiring as you grow, um, having that kind of diaspora of talent is, is really powerful. But I think, you know, one, one question is un uncertainty. I mean, there's a lot more uncertainty in, in the sort of uh, political situation in the U.S. right now. But with uh, Brexit looming, I think, you know, I mean, it's a big question mark, right? And so um, it will... It, it is having an impact. It will have an impact over the next year. So, I mean, if, if this is the year, um, hopefully we'll stay in in June and, uh, and, and hopefully calm some of those fears. But that's, that's probably one of my bigger question marks for the year. In, in terms of uncertainty, uh, Trump versus Brexit, I would take Brexit, though. <laughs> maybe sorry, it's my American, maybe my Americanness in there. <laughs> the sheer fear of Trump. <laughs> I'm moving here if he gets elected. <laughs> Nadine. Look, I think this is like comparing uh, which is the best Ivy League school to go to, right? Um, so uh, there are lots of places. The good thing about FinTech is global. Uh, it's happening in lots of places. It's not just one center. I think the important things which London has, seems to have at the moment, is uh, talent, it's capital, regulatory environment, some of the financial stability that's there, some of the historic uh, uh, nature of financial services here. Uh, within a square mile, you can walk around and connect to everyone as opposed to having to go to different cities and so on. So I think that's an advantage, but, uh, you know, but this is a global play. I don't think we should get caught up in which city is better than the other. Uh, I think there's talent everywhere. And we certainly, as Antimus, invest uh, globally. So uh, that's what we're seeking the best of the best. And Gareth and Mike, we've got the East Coast and the West Coast of the States represented, but you still have affection for London, yeah? I do. I mean, I grew up a mile away from here, and I think the regulators have done a tremendous job here in the yeah. UK, much better than what's, uh, what's happened in, in the US. And I've you know, been to 10 Downing Street, and I've been to the White House, and I've spoken to both, and I think you guys have done really a tremendous job, so hopefully that will stand you in good stead. Indeed. Well, you know, 500 startups invest in 50 countries around the world right now. There's phenomenal talent everywhere. This is a great place to build a fintech um, startup, I would say. And in terms of uncertainty, the best entrepreneurs always find a way around it. All right. On that note, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, show your appreciation for our panel this morning. Thank you. <laughs>